That's okay. You're juggling lots of things. Thanks. Yeah, I think I just hit record. So hopefully, yeah, it's recording now. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I did intend to do that. All right. Um, the other thing that staff should do prior to going out is making sure that they have a surgical mask, eye protection, or a face shield that they can wear um, to go out to the home with them. We recommend that all staff wear face shields because um, there might be times during the crisis intervention where the child might pull down the mask or um, not be wearing the mask the entire time. And so that's why we're asking staff to wear that face shield um, on top of wearing that surgical mask. Um, again, we would ask the family and the child um, to wear a mask if possible, use motivational interviewing to ask them to wear that and bring out additional masks if they need that um, because they don't have any at the home. Um, but if they're answering yes to any of the questions on the COVID, then again, we would pivot and offer them virtual options. Um, right now, what, we were going to put all of the schedules, like the on call schedules on the internet, um, but we thought it might be a better idea to actually put it in public folders. So in um, your email under public folders, there is a new thing that says children mobile crisis, where the supervisors in each of the counties can put in who is the um, on call for that day and night, um, whatever the rotation is, so that the CMIT can go to that space and be able to know who they should get a hold of. During the daytime hours, CMIT will be attempting to contact the case holder, um, especially if the case is open to home base, to see if that home base worker can go out um, and handle the crisis um, with their case. If that case holder is not available or if they're on annual leave or something else, then they would um, they would connect with that on-call worker um, and then they would discuss kind of on the way, they either you know drive together or they can talk on the phone on the way to the um, home about how, kind of who's gonna take the lead um, I always suggest kind of talking with them of um, most of the time when you go out to a crisis situation, I suggest um, separating um, the two people that are escalating. So if it's a child and a parent, I would suggest one crisis worker work with the parent and one works with the child and separate them for a period of time. And then you can bring them back for a family meeting at the end. Um, why you separate them is to deescalate um, what's happening. If you go in there and you don't separate them and you start talking about what happened, then what's going to happen is that child's going to escalate even further um, because the parent might say something that will trigger the child or the child might trigger the parent. And so that's why we separate them so that they can calm down. We can connect with them. We can be empathetic and kind of, you know, talk with them, kind of get to them at a place where they can come back together and talk about safety planning. Um, in order to do that, you really want to, prior to going out to the home, kind of make a plan for that. Um, if it's a primary, if the um, on-call worker is a children's um, worker that works in home base, it probably makes sense for that person to kind of take the clinical lead and um, make the decision on whether, you know, they should go with the parent or the child um, and kind of work with that with, you know, the crisis team. The crisis team, most of the members of the crisis team um, have not had a lot of training in children's, um, you know, working with children. They do work with all ages, um, but they don't have specific training on BFST or PCIT or any of those interventions. Um, so that would be my suggestion, but it'd be up to the pair how they want to make that decision and what makes the most sense. Um, when you get, get out to the home, you can always pivot, you know, you can always change that and that's okay um, to pull the, your team member to the side and say, hey, can you take the child and I take the parent, whatever makes sense, but I would have that communication. Um, prior to going in and kind of the strategy for de-escalation. Some of the safety considerations when you're driving up to the home is um, if possible, um, you never want to like actually park in their um, driveway. With that said, in a lot of our country homes, there's not an option. The driveways are very, very long <laughs> and you're not, you can't park on the road because it'd be a mile walk into the home. That's okay. Um, if there's an option to be able to back up the car and so that your car is facing outward, that's a suggestion I would make. If you're in the city limits, if you're able to park on the um, street and walk up to the home, that would be another suggestion. Um, when I've done trainings with police officers, that's always been their suggestion. Um, the other safety um, protocols to put in place is um, when you go into the home, try to as much as possible be close to the door. Um, never turn your back to members of the family. Um, and then when you're 
making that decision on separating the children or separating the, you know, the children from the, you know, sibling or separating the children, child from the um, guardian. Other thing to think about is, are they on a really busy road? Um, I always like to, when I used to do home based, um, I always like to take the person that was escalating out and outside um, and walk around and just walk with them to kind of get them at a place where they're able to destabilize. I wouldn't do that if I was on the main road somewhere and um, the possibility of them running into the road is going to be a lot higher. Um, I would suggest instead to have the guardians go outside with the other person and have the child remain in. The other thing too is sometimes the child's at an escalation where they're not going to be able to go. They're not able to take direction because of they're they're not making decisions. I mean, they're in that um, fight, flight, freeze method and so they're not making decisions. You're not going to be able to get them to go out and redirect them to go outside. And in those situations, you always make sure that everyone's safe from them. So all the dogs are put away, um, all siblings that are younger um, are vulnerable, that they're in a different place in the house, that they're not in the same room of, as the child that's escalating. And then I'd have the guardian be the ones that go out versus the child going out. Um, but again, as much as possible, you're going to make, you know, when you go there, you'd make that decision um, based on what's happening. Sometimes you're going to get there because it's going to be like an hour later and they're already de-escalated and they're at a place where you can walk in and you can sit down with them. You can start right away with doing a safety plan. Um, you know, there's going to be situations where it's going to fizzle out on its own and de-escalate. And then you, again, you'll be able to just come in, do the team meeting, do the safety plan. But if you go out and the person's still escalating, then that's when you kind of make those decisions um, and what makes sense in that situation. But it's going to be case by case. Again, there are situations where you're going to be able to redirect the child outside. It's safe. They have a lot of property. You can go in the backyard and kind of walk with them. And that'll make sense. You might go into one situation where it's not going to be, you're not going to be able to redirect the child. So again, you would have the other person go outside instead. Um, you just kind of base it on what's going on and, and what makes sense in that situation. Um, if you get to the home and the dogs are not put away, that would be the first thing I would ask before stepping through the door. Again, can you please, um, while we're out here, can you please um, have the dogs go into a bedroom in the back or go in their crate? Um, I know people will say my dog's so friendly and I would say, I understand that your dog's super friendly and, you know, I love animals too. Um, I just don't want to also, you know, put them at risk either because animals are at risk of getting harmed in crisis situations too. And I don't want them to be overstimulated. So that's kind of the approach I would take about making sure the dogs are put away or any other animals. I know that one home-based case there's a raccoon pet <laughs> so i'd be like can you put your raccoon away um any other animals that are large um i'd have them put away the other thing that we wanted to talk a little bit about is a body position um anytime that someone's in crisis you want to make sure that you have some proximity away from them you're never going to approach a person and get within their bubble when they're escalated you're going to maintain a distance from them um because they're quick and so you want to make sure that there's some room um, I always, when I am um, dealing with a crisis situation, I'm always going to have an open position in my arms, meaning like my arms are going to be out. They're not going to be folded like this. They're not going to be wrapped up like this. They're always going to be open. I'm not going to be like this, but they're going to be open at my sides. That's called the open position. Um, you're always going to have your feet um, that are going to be a little bit further, the shoulder width apart and bent knees. Um, an open position. Sometimes people put one foot in front of the other just so that you have some stability um, and that you are just in a stance that has some stability um, while you're talking to them. But again, the open stance doesn't mean that you have your arms raised like this or like, you know, you want to have an open, um, you know, you want your arms ready, but the, you want them at their side um, during that time. Christian, anything else that you can think about body positioning or the car or anything? That I missed. Um, so one thing that I tried when we did this pre-COVID, um, you know, BC, um, was consolidating at a location halfway or, or whatever makes sense. Like, let's say, for example, um, staff was coming from south and we were actually going, or the office and the person responding was coming from south area and we were all going north we would come up with an area that made sense to me. So we would arrive in one vehicle. Um, so that way we could case console before we got there, we can game plan. And also there's, you know, one vehicle, especially for some of our more rural areas, it might make sense to only have one vehicle so nobody gets stuck or anything like that. Liz, can you touch base on if some, if the kid elopes from the home, like what would be the plan to do 
moving forward? Depends on the situation. I mean, sometimes when I've gone out to homes, like the child, like will try to go out in the backyard or in the woods and I'll go out with them. If I'm the assigned person to that child, I'll go out into the woods and, and um, try to kind of talk with them like in a calming voice to have them come back. Um, if you get there and they already eloped, um, then it would be a discussion with the parents on where would they go? You know, where would the child go? Would they go to the school? Would they go to a friend's house? Let's call the friend's house. Let's call parents. Um, let's go to the school. Who in their life do they do they really like? Is there an uncle or an aunt that they have a great relationship with? Can we pull them in and have them call and have that um, child return back? Um, so it's kind of depends on the situation. Again, if they're already gone, then it'd be trying to locate them and have them return so that you can have a discussion with them. Um, so if it gets to a point where they're gone for a long time, then um, the parents can call the police and, and do a report on that. But first, I'd have the parents try to locate them. So if they leave in the middle of it, you would say to follow them, like, let's say it's in town and they take off and continue yep. to run. Okay. Yep. I've done it. I mean, I've even done it around the building. I mean, I went round and round with someone around the building, like probably like six times. One time, one of them bolted in the cornfield and I, you know, I went there a little bit. I mean, I'm not going to like be on top of them. Like, um, I'm going to give them a little bit of space. Um, a lot of times, again, that's their reflex. Um, a lot of our children and adults have trauma and significant trauma. And so they have three, re, you know, three things that they're going to do. They're going to fight, flight, or they're going to freeze. Um, so that, that is, you know, that's what their body is telling them to do is, is take off. And, um, you know, I just kind of just talk to them and, and, you know, sometimes they just need to run for a little bit and then they're able to kind of calm down and then you're able to kind of, you know, start that discussion with them. Um, when they're escalated at that point, you're always going to want to do very simple sentences to them, um, very simple direction. You don't want to do complex things um, because they cannot, they can't uh, process it in their brain because of where their brain's at. Um, reassurance, just talking to them, just saying, you know, I want to talk to you and just, you know, trying to, trying to bring them back so that you can have a conversation. I always suggest walking with them um, if you can. Just, just walk with them around the backyard. Um, I do, I've done that several times where I just walk and walk and walk until they're at a place where they can start having a, a real conversation. And then you start with open-ended and um, kind of get a connection with them. And then you go from there. Um, one of the man skills is radar. Um, I suggest you always have radar. I think people have radar and they just don't realize that it's called radar. I think people on a regular basis do this. At least I do when I'm in a restaurant, I'm constantly looking at my surroundings. I constantly um, position myself at a, at a place at the table where I can see everyone that's coming in and I never have my back to the, the main part of a restaurant. I don't know if I'm paranoid <laughs> or what, but that's just me. Um, I'm like that in any situation. I'm gonna assess. If you're in the office, you should be assessing. If you're at a home, you should be assessing. You should be looking um, at your environment, looking at the person, looking at the situation nonstop um, because stuff can change. Um, and so you're always going to have your radar on and you're always going to be looking at that stuff. Um, the first part of the radar is recognized. So again, you want to um, be aware of other people's actions and environment. You want to use your sixth sense um, in this situation. You want to assess yourself. I always say I want to check myself. When I used to do on call, I would always have this process on the way to the ED in the middle of the night. Like I would play a certain song in my car. And even if I was awake most of the night and I wasn't, you know, didn't sleep, I'd have to check myself because I can't go in and project my emotional state on the consumer. And so I'd play a certain song, get a certain, you know, get get something going, and then I'd I'd assess where I'm at a place now. Yep, I can go in and I can handle this. Um, so you always want to assess yourself. Um, do you have a relationship with the person? Is there someone else that has a better relationship? Again, if two people go out to a home and one has a really good relationship with the child, that's the person that should be with that child. If they don't have a good relationship, then opposite. You know, we would never want to put an on-call worker or a CMIT worker with someone where the child's like, I don't like them. So you're, you're going to flip-flop that. Um, you want to be aware of like how you're projecting yourself, your emotional and um, just your body language in general. I'm very much an eye roller. You're, my mom would tell you I was pain when I was a teenager. I roll my eyes. You can tell what I feel on my face. I'm, I'm a very blunt person. That's just my personality. I have to check myself for that because I don't ever want to come across this one 
that I am minimizing what they're going through. And so I, for a long time, when I started therapy, looked at myself in the mirror and, and, and practice making sure that I don't eye roll. I don't have certain body language things. You have to assess yourself and make sure you're not doing that. It's that other person. What are their needs? Are they being met? What's the previous history? How much distance should you have from them? Um, what's causing this person to act out? Sometimes it's simple as, we'll talk about Maslow hierarchy in a minute. They just are hungry. Maybe they need some food. Maybe that's it. They haven't eaten in six hours. Giving them a snack might calm down the situation. Um, so what are those needs? What, what has created it? Are they acting out because there's a certain friend that's over? Have that friend leave, you know? that moment. Um, assess the environment always. Um, look for um, any kind of um, things that could be used as weapons inside and out. Um, again, looking at the busy road, is it really busy road? How much space is in the back? It, you know, would it be okay to go on the backyard? Um, after you do all that assessment and it's an ongoing assessment, then you're going to decide what you're going to do um, after you assess the situation and then you're going to act on that. And most of the acting is going to be a verbal response. Um, you're going to uh, do a lot of, again, open-ended questions, connect with that person. Um, and then when you get to a place, you're going to be able to redirect them and really talk about safety planning and um, kind of what to do for the rest of the night. Crisis might reinforce negative behaviors in the middle of a crisis. Um, it's going to happen. We might have to give that child an iPad to calm him down for the night. Um, I know that as a therapist, I hate that. I hate that we have to reinforce stuff in the middle of it, um, but sometimes we have to do that. That's what ongoing therapy is for. That's what um, therapists and home-based therapists can work on is you know, being able to restrict that iPad at a later date, not in the middle of a crisis. Um, so again, you might do stuff that um, is you know, in your mind, you're like, oh, this is reinforcing. But again, your job is to de-escalate this situation. That's, that's your main focus in this interaction. De-escalate. And then um, again, the therapist has to work with the family on an ongoing basis to be able to restrict stuff in the future when they're not so escalated where it's causing physical danger, that kind of stuff. Um, the, the last part of radar is the review the results. I think we miss this a lot. I think that after a crisis situation, we handle it. And then we never, we never pivot back with the family to say, how did it go? Um, we never pivot back to the child to say, how did that intervention, um, you know, how was that for you? What went wrong? What didn't go wrong? Well, when Liz told me to be quiet, that was awful. That really triggered me. Okay, we're going to put in here, don't say be quiet. Don't use this terminology in a safety plan so that the next crisis worker and um, on-call worker know not to use that certain word because that triggers that child. Um, you always want to review those results. Um, not during the crisis. It's going to be the next day or the following week that you're going to review the results and update the safety plan and do all that stuff. Um, because again, a lot of the stuff you're doing then, you might not even be able to get to a place to do a safety plan with them that night. You might only be able to work with them on how to keep everyone safe until the next day. Um, and that's okay. We want as much as possible to do a safety plan and have a plan in place, but sometimes you're not able to do that. You're again, stabilizing them to the next um, session that they have. We talked about Maslow's a little bit. Um, I always think about this. Um, if their basic human needs are not being met, um, how are we talking to them about CBT and how they feel and how, all this other stuff? Um, you have to go from the very basic. Um, and again, sometimes we had one child that was escalating significantly in one of the offices. He hadn't eaten in six hours. Um, we, we made sure the parent was okay with giving him a, um, a granola bar. He got something to drink. He calmed down after that. It's not always that simple. I'm not saying it is, but sometimes it is that simple. Um, they need sleep, they need to eat, they need all of those things in order to be able to feel safe um, and secure um, to kind of, you know, be able to de-escalate stuff. So that's, again, sometimes it's the most obvious things and you forget about the obvious things like food and water and stuff like that. But I always go to that because I learned that lesson from that one child that it was eating. Um, it was, you know, because they went all day. Um, a lot of times it's from lack of sleep too, where the kids aren't getting a lot of sleep and, and that's really what they're needing is sleep. Um, but it's important to kind of go back to that basic human need prior to talking to them about safety and security and then healthy relationships and kind of going up over that. 
Um, this is, the man has a crisis cycle. This is how kind of they identify um, the crisis cycle and uh, different interventions that you can do at each phase of the crisis cycle, depending on where the person's at. Um, and so what they mention is that baseline, um, during baseline, um, workers or parents should be engaging the person to support them in doing what they like to do. Um, so it's just basically like acknowledging like, you know, you like, you know, playing video games or you like coloring or kind of engaging them in that. Um, if the person um, gets triggered, listen, identify and try to remove that stimulus, whatever is triggering them. Um, if there's a certain thing in their environment that's triggering them, trying to remove that before it escalates further. Um, if it does escalate to that lower phase, um, engage with the person to offer them um, options from their baseline. So at this point, asking them, do you want to color with me? Do you want to go for a walk? Um, do you want to um, play a game? Do you want to do some other stuff? Um, if they get into that higher phase, um, it is also engaged and then you're cueing a replacement behavior. Um, and so looking at something else that they can do, giving them choices, um, they always say that you wanna give people three choices if you can, um, because they feel like they actually have a choice in that when it's three. Um, I know a long time ago, we were taught like two choices, now it's three because it's more choice. Um, but getting them options, trying to redirect them away from um, removing again, you're always gonna to wanna to remove that stimulus at every phase of the crisis cycle. Um, if it's a sibling that's triggering them or continuing to trigger them. So they might've been triggered by something you know, prior to the escalation, but then the siblings, um, they're kind of egging on the mom to say stuff or do stuff, um, which is making that child kind of escalate further. Having mom redirect that child, that sibling that's kind of escalating stuff to another room, to another bedroom, have them go somewhere else so that they're not continuing to have that child escalate further. Um, at the very top, what you're looking at is protection. Um, use the least amount of interaction necessary for safety. Um, so in this one, you're not talking to them um, because they're so escalated. You're just removing anything that they might harm. So you're removing animals, you're removing, um, you're removing like, you know, other things that they might hurt or damage. Um, you're blocking them. If they try to run in the road, you're trying to block them from going in that road um, if they're dangerous to themselves or others. Um, directing the parents to take away, if they have a knife or anything like that, um, to remove that. Um, but again, when they're in that very high part, um, talking to them about options, they're not gonna hear that because they're in that fight flight um, freeze and they, they can't understand choices at that time. So at that point, you're just protecting, you're just protecting everything in the environment, removing stuff. Um, the next part is de-escalation. So you engage, you structure the cooling off process. Um, I always suggest if there's a very big spike of um, walking with them, so you would engage them, like, let's go for a walk. Um, you know, after they've kind of thrown something through a window or kicked something or done something, um, if they're at the place where they're starting to like, you know, their breathing starting to slow down a little bit, then you know they might be at a place to engage them to go do something else. Um, walking is probably the, the best I can think of um, during this time period um, because they still have a lot of adrenaline going through them. So walking and kind of talking um, has been beneficial that I've seen. Um, then it's stabilization. So you're listening to them, active listening. And then um, after that, it's post-crisis pain. So you listen to them, observe and support them during that. Um, most of the time when they're at that time, they're really tired. Um, they want to sleep. They want to go to bed and that's okay for them to go to bed. And um, that's the best option to do. Again, you're not going to do the... Um, like a lot of the, a lot of times parents want to do the consequences in this higher phase crisis, this section, you're not going to do consequences in that. That's just going to escalate them further. Um, even though I, I get it, you know, the parents are just as frustrated with the situation. They're like, well, this kid's damaging stuff. They're doing this stuff. I want to give a consequence. Um, now is not the time. If there's a plan in place with the you know home based worker to do a certain thing, like they have to repair walls or they have to do other things, if they break things in the home, they have to replace it. Whatever that is, that should wait until the next day for them to kind of have that conversation with the child. Um, you're not going to want to have that conversation during this um, during this period of time because that might push them again to escalate and go back up the mountain. We talked a little bit already about divide and conquer. Um, and so again, you're, you're gonna wanna have one person go with the um, child, another person to go with a sibling or you know, 
depending on what's going on and then someone else go with the guardian. Um, make sure you're assertive when directing this interaction. Um, that's what the parents are wanting is someone to, um, a lot of times if I can, I'm gonna direct the parents in doing these things. They might be at a place where they're not able to do that. And so um, if, I, if I can't have the parents, um, if I can't activate them to redirect the siblings in other rooms and remove the dogs or do something other, other stuff, then I'll, in some situations, I'm gonna take that active role and do it. Um, as much as possible, you're going to want to leverage the parents and guardians in doing those directions. Um, after this, um, after you separated them again, um, oh, yeah, we talked a little bit about this. Um, ensuring younger siblings are safe, animals are safe, should be top priority in any situation. I always recommend for children um, safety plans that there's always a plan in there for younger siblings um, to be removed from the situation or animals because a lot of our kiddos um, direct their anger on their younger siblings or animals. And so that's the first role that a parent should have in a safety plan is removing anyone that might be hurt first. Um, and then sometimes you just gotta let the, again, if the escalation happened in the family room, maybe the best idea is to remove everyone else from the family room except the crisis worker and the child let that child have space until they're able to calm down and and be able to re, be redirected to kind of talk about what's going on um at any time you know safety is number one so at any time you guys can pivot and make a different decision and so if you get there and it's so escalated where people are being hurt and it, it's to a point where um it's far beyond um, being able to take a walk with them or being able to remove stuff, you might have to call the police and that and that's okay. Um, we want to make sure that you guys are safe um, when you go in there. Um, and we trust your instincts if the police need to be called in those situations um, to handle that. Um, some language that's, you know, that's helpful, again, is using open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening, um, summary reflections. I know it's really tough when parents want to say um, pretty negative things about their children in this situation, but you got to understand that this parent is just gone through probably their 10th crisis in a couple of days, and they're not doing well right now. Um, I know it's hard to be empathetic when you hear sometimes some of the parents say some of the things about their kids. Um, that's why you separate the child from the parent, so the parents have room to be able to say some of that stuff and get some of that stuff out, and the child's not hearing it. Um, you really want to connect with that parent and, and let them know, like, I'm so glad you called us today. I, I get that you're so frustrated. I get that, you know, this is the third escalation in the day or the week or whatever, and, and kind of, you know, get that connection with that parent um, to be able to leverage change, you know, because no parent at the end of the day wants their kid escalating, you know, they don't want um, all this stuff happening in their household, you know. Um, so, you know, again, one thing is just allow them the space to be able to, to vent out some of that stuff um, and coming from a non-judgmental phase, you know. For me, there's certain triggers I have, um, you know, when, when parents call like children, like certain words, I, I, I know it's a trigger in me and I know I've had to be aware of those things because um, all of, we get triggered too, you know, when parents say stuff, when kids say stuff to us, we're, we, we're human, you know, so knowing yourself what might be something that's triggering so you know that you got to take a breath and then know how to respond in those situations. Um, again, I always go to the place of um, this, this parent probably has had to deal with this for weeks on end and they're at their end, you know, they're at their, their end of their rope and so allowing them that space to vent and kind of get it out. Again, some crises are just gonna dissolve prior to you getting there. Cause again, it's gonna take an hour for you guys to get out there. Um, again, we might, you might reinforce stuff. Um, the might, the, maybe the only solution in that night would be to give that child a, an iPad or give them a coloring book or give them something to deescalate what's going on right now. Um, which might again, reinforce behaviors, but the parent, the, the family has got to get a in a place of stabilization before they're able to really remove stuff um, and be able to do consequences efficiently. If they're, the child's that escalated, doing some of that is just gonna trigger the child and, and do stuff. So again, you're gonna, um, you're gonna have to make that choice in that situation. And um, your primary role that night is just to deescalate and get them to a place where they can be okay that night until they're able to get ongoing um, ongoing um you know assistance 
I always think humor is a great thing to lighten the mood if you can use humor in a good way. <laughs> if you're able to make anyone laugh, it's good. It just breaks the tension in the household. I use that all the time if you're able to use that. Make sure your voice is, is lowered. Um, you wanna make sure that your tone is appropriate when you're talking to someone and that the proximity um, away from that person is enough. Um, I know there was a situation where someone got down on like trying to go eye to eye with a child that was escalated and the child kind of, um, kind of, you know, kicked. And so in those situations, I get trying to be eye to eye with a child, but don't get eye to eye with them until they're in that post drain part of the crisis phase. You want to have proximity away from them. Um, it's okay to walk away sometimes if the child is, is um, you know, acting up and all the siblings and everyone else is out of the family room and you go in the kitchen for a minute, that's okay. Um, if you're able to give them choices, again, give three choices. Um, um, always keep the sentences brief and simple. Um, you, the, another main role that you have is making sure that they feel heard in that moment. Uh, make sure that you're able to give a connection with them. Um, voice volume for me, I'm, I'm a loud talker. And so that's another thing that you just have to be mindful of. Are you a loud talker? If you are, make sure that you're bringing your voice down in those situations, checking your nonverbal throughout it. Um, and just making sure that those sentences are very brief and simple um, until they're able to get to a place where you can talk a little bit more with them. Um, I mentioned trauma triggers, um, you know, I can go on and on about trauma-informed care. Um, I think that what's, what's difficult in the situations that we're going into is that parents have their own trauma triggers on top of the children's trauma triggers, and so they kind of trigger each other back and forth, um, and so it's really, really tough. You have to be mindful of both the parent's trauma triggers and the, and the child, and also what is their response in those situations. You know, they can have different responses. You know, the child could be a flight person and the, the parent could be a freeze person. Are we asking them to do certain things that are difficult when they're in that space too? So how can we get the parent um, down to a place where they're able to redirect their child? You know, talking to them about like mindfulness, talking to them about taking breaths, blowing up a balloon, blowing bubbles, doing anything so that the parent can get out of place that they can redirect that child. If you go into a situation where the parent is just as escalated, again, you're gonna use simple questions. You're not gonna be able to have that parent redirect that child in that minute until they're able to calm themselves down. And so part of it might be just talking to the parent and having them breathe with you. And that's all you're doing for a couple of minutes to get the parent out of place where you can have that conversation. Um, I always say talking about consequences and rewards um, is just not a good idea um, when there's an escalation that's happening. Um, you're gonna to wanna to do that at a later date because um, the child's not gonna be at that place. And if you say, oh, you're, you're grounded for two weeks or you're grounded for a week, grounded for a week, what we see a lot is the parents will go back and forth and the, the child just gets escalated and escalated. Um, so you're not gonna to wanna to do that during that time. Um, Here's another worksheet, I'll send this to you guys. Um, it's just a de-escalation preference chart. Um, so you can you know, kind of work with the family on this. Ways that they can um, protect in here, um, who they should protect in here. Is it the younger siblings, animals? Um, if they have a, a child that has a disability, you'd wanna put that in there. Um, ways that they can protect in an appropriate way. Um, you know, how to engage, how to, you know, listen. A lot of parents have to be, you know, kind of talked about with open-ended questions. A lot of times they don't know that. So they start interviewing their children, which might be triggering. So talking to them about how do you, how do you connect with your child? Um, you know, how to do open-ended questions and that kind of stuff. Um, so kind of working out that. Again, I'll send that to you guys um, if you think it's helpful. Here's another one from Mant too that might be helpful for younger kids that can't really do a safety plan by talking. Um, this might be a really good way for them to circle um, certain things that trigger them and have them like circle the, the picture versus writing it out. Um, so this might be another tool that might be helpful for you guys that you guys can use. I'll send it out um, next week for you guys if you think it would be helpful. Um, here's also like, you know, what happens to my body when I'm angry, scared, or upset um, so that the parent kind of knows some of the warning signs that happen prior to them getting to the place that they're going to escalate significantly. So you would have them circle these and then put that right into the safety plan and so that the parent knows kind of 
these are some things to be on the lookout for. And then different things that help them um, feel better. Um, so what would be helpful? We do have weighted blankets in each of the offices. We have fidget tools, stress balls, and other stuff. So if you guys want to take out some of those um, on these calls, you can. Um, that might be helpful for both the parents and the um, child to kind of do this until they're at a place where they can focus and start talking. Um, you might want to give them one of these fidget tools or stress balls um, for a little bit to kind of de-escalate. And then stuff that helps them like hearing, listening, that kind of stuff. And then um, different smells that make, make them feel better, like perfumes or, um, you know, certain candles people like. Um, I always talk to uh, people about having like a kit, like a self-care kit that they can go to um, in the future. If they, they're starting to get escalated, then they can go directly there and it has special like activities in it that they can use. Um, when they start seeing some of those warning signs, the parent can kind of direct them towards those kind of activities. Um, some kids just need to be in a black space. They need to be like, I, I had one parent like get a big refrigerator box and the child like um, put all this stuff, like did designs in the refrigerator box and the kid just wanted to go in there and calm down. They, and we got them like um, headphones too. So we put on the headphones, he went in the box and then he'd come out like 15 minutes later after he kind of calmed down. That was what was helpful for him. Um, so, and I know Mary will go into a little bit more with people that have autism or children with autism, but that's good for anyone, especially if they're in that fight flight mode um, to kind of get them at, you know, a different place. Anything that's helpful for them, um, I'd include in that safety plan for them. Um, when is, I can't read the top, when is, oh, when has the situation gotten to the point where a meeting can occur? So um, if they're responding to redirection, if the humor has worked and people are laughing and they're at a place where, um, you know, the guardian and the child are both really calm, um, and the siblings are removed, if you feel like the siblings are going to escalate. Um, if there's a, a person that the child really listens to, like an aunt, an uncle, or a family member, um, getting that person on the phone, like a conference call with them, or having them come out to the house might be helpful too. Um, but you'll kind of know, you'll be able to see in like their face and their body language that they're de-escalated at a place where you might be able to bring them back together um, and kind of connect with them on that. When they're at that place, um, I always recommend that the next step is to meet with your other team member privately so that you guys can kind of connect, swap stories, kind of talk about what happened, what the one person said versus the other, what kind of escalated stuff, and then brainstorm how to approach the family and what next steps to do. Um, who's going to kind of take the lead um, in the family meeting and how to kind of balance making sure both parties feel heard and validated during the meeting. Um, once you kind of connected with your team member, and again, it could be just quietly in the kitchen, you know, or um, you can step outside really quickly, let the family know you'll be right back and then kind of confer on that and then come back and do the family meeting. Um, Christian's gonna take on from the rest of this. Any questions about any of the de-escalation stuff um, that we talked about? There were questions in the chat box, Elizabeth, probably, or Liz, sorry. There were questions in the chat box, like three three of them. Okay. I answered those in the chat. Yeah, so someone said take your medications. Yeah, you, you'd want to um, have them lock up medications. Um, how to respond when someone's talking about consequences in the, mo the moment threats with um, grounding. What I usually do so that I, I don't, um, I don't want to ever in the eyes of the child, take any power away from the parents. Um, sometimes what I would do is I'd have my partner have the go away with the child, like just, just separate them in that moment if the parent's moving towards that. Um, or I'll ask to do like a sidebar with the parent and I would talk to them about, um, you know, what I always say to them and I've had parents watch videos on like the brain. Um, sometimes that's helpful for parents, sometimes it's not. But what I say to them is right now, um, they're not able to understand consequences or anything like that. Um, and so we just have to get a, at a place where we're gonna be able to meet back and we will talk about this at a later date. Um, so I would just kind of footnote it with the parent, let them know that we'll talk about this, but right now we just wanna get them to a place where we can talk to them. Um, 
Someone said, can you designate an agency car that will have a supply of these tools? Um, CMIT will have, um, can have those in there. Um, they also have lock boxes so that they can take those out and meet the other on-call um, worker with it. I can check with Chris too to make sure that um, we still have the, we used to have a bunch of different fidgets and stuff. So we might have to get some more for the different offices. I still have weighted blankets in my office. So if any of the counties need those, um, but we'll refill those if you guys find any of this stuff helpful. Yeah, I think we're talking about doing like go boxes or something like that, that they can uh, sit with the CMIT and uh, take them out with them. The other thing I suggest is uh, um, I have a, I used to have stacks of coloring pages um, for kids, especially if you go into a house with younger siblings, I'll give the, um, I'll take crayons out with me and um, photocopied color pages or I'll go to the dollar store and just get like books that you can give to the other siblings um, so that they're, they don't get into the middle of the crisis. That's also helpful too. Do you want me to stop sharing so you can share, Chris? Uh, no, if you want to do it, that's fine. I okay. don't have that pulled up. Um, so holding a family meeting. So, you know, as, as we're starting to wrap up the, the crisis console, you know, we've kind of de-escalated the situation. Um, have, uh, have had a conversation with the child, the parent. Um, we're going to hold a family meeting. We're going to come back together. Um, the crisis worker, CMIT, the, the, any of the parents or supports that are in the home, whomever that might be, the children that are in the home, we're all going to come together and kind of brainstorm um, and to develop what, what, what the next step and how do we go from here. Um, we're going to want to make sure that we're including all of the key players. Um, so, it, you know, if there happens to be aunts or uncles or somebody that's, uh, you know, maybe living with them or something to that effect, um, that those people might necessarily might not necessarily be part of that conversation. We're talking about those people that are have those that power and that family dynamic um, and that who they're directly impacted by. Um, so those are the people that we're going to want to to be in part of that. Um, it's okay to be assertive. Um, you know, part of that is we're, we're doing kind of that quick and dirty crisis stuff. We're not necessarily doing therapy. We're doing psychoeducation, but we're also trying to just deescalate that. That's our goal here. Um, and like Liz was talking about earlier, sometimes, unfortunately, we need to reinforce bad behaviors or, or in a, an, an undesired behavior to get through that crisis so we can get to that ongoing therapy. Um, modeling and redirection, redirecting healthy communication. So this kind of goes back to uh, like BSFT models. Um, so we're, we're going to want to uh, uh, help to uh, facilitate that healthy communication. Um, you know, uh, being able to use examples like, have you ever told your mom or the, the child uh, you're worried that you're uh, going to lose your son? So reflecting some of those things, just really fostering that, that healthy and appropriate communication as directly as possible when appropriate, or redirecting it to be um, direct with the parent and child or guardian and child. Um, so uh, pull out affection and emotion when possible. So we're gonna wanna look at it objectively uh, and kind of using those, those DBT skills, uh, analyzing that situation. Um, Making it about the family um, family system. So again, talking about um, you know identifying what's happening. So going back to that assertive thing. If we're identififying issues that we're having, we're going to want to identify that and talk about it as a family system, and then gear the the response to that as the family system, um, not using escapes or using um, excuses for what's going on. Next slide. Um, so when we're writing the plan, so we're going to want to document and we're going to want to uh, safety plan, we're going to want to pull all this stuff together. And when we do so, we're going to want it to be clear and concise, uh, you know, very, very uh, abrupt, very um, clearly pointed out points. Um, schedule the next 24 hours. So part of that safety plan, part of that conversation that we're going to have is what's going to happen. We're going to try to itemize and discuss what's going to happen. So the next, uh, you know, say that conversation was at nine o'clock at night. Okay. And the next hour, we're going to go through the bedtime ritual from 10 PM until school starts, whatever that looks like, or wake up starts for school. Um, it's going to look like sleep. What are we going to do? How are we going to plan all that out um, to, to get to that point? And we'll get on to why the 24 hour piece in a minute. Safety planning. We're going to want a safety plan and we'll just discuss safety plans and kind of that anatomy of the safety plan here in a minute as well. 
um, calling them after a couple of hours to see if the plan is working or, and how they're doing. So this is something that CMIT is going to do. Um, you know, after the contact is over, we're going to schedule a well check by CMIT uh, within a few hours of that. So we're going to we're not just going to want to be done with that crisis contact and assume that the next 24 hours are going to go great because um, it might not be. Things might might uh, you know fall through. Situations might happen. So we're going to want to reassess that very very quickly to ensure that stabilization is, is maintained and that um, we can reinforce whatever needs to happen or or um, assess different options if that's what's needed. Um, so, so that's what we're gonna be doing there. Um, we're gonna wanna outline the parent's role or the support's role in the safety planning um, very um, assertively. We're gonna wanna make sure that they know outright, these are, this is your role in that safety plan and that, in that process. Um, if they're in a really good place and everybody's kind of calm, de-escalated, and they're just that family, you guys know who I'm talking about, those families that are receptive to that conversation or receptive and, and um, being able to apply things or think about those things a little bit more critically, we might want to chain out those behaviors. And if we chain out those behaviors, we can gear that safety plan towards those, those chained behaviors and those um, those um, that understanding of the chain of events. If they're not in a good place, then we're just going to want to do um, kind of that minimal safety plan when it comes to directing um, immediate safety concerns or immediate um, reactions to some of those behaviors that might kind of come up as opposed to that 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 pro level of we need to dissect those things. Um, parents and support should be included in the safety plan. Um, this is a twofold thing. We, we want parents to be uh, included in that safety plan, not just as uh, taking their 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 role and their consider or their comments and their observations into consideration. We're going to want them to be active participants uh, in whatever activity that we're giving, um, whatever uh, coping skills that they've identified. We're going to want to outline and identify their role. It's not just yes, you're going to do a deep breathing exercise. How are the parents going to facilitate that? How are they going to um, how are they going to mobilize the child to do it? How are they going to um, model that behavior? What is their role in those safety plans, um, safety planning incidences and those, um, those uh, coping skills that we're trying to get them to, to utilize while we're not there? Um, so we're going to talk about the anatomy of a safety plan. First of all, it's brief. Um, we're, we're not trying to make this a very long, uh, convoluted, complex thing. Um, we want things to be bullet pointed, short sentences, easy to read, uh, and something that's in the family's own words. Uh, we're going to want to use direct codes. I mean, when you're doing PCP, same, same principle. Um, we want to use their ideas, their strategies as much as possible because they're more likely to use them. They're more likely to engage in them when they need to. Um, we're not trying to create this long convoluted list of, of clinical terms where we're just trying to keep it as short as possible um, because we want them to be able to pick it up or remember it quickly in those moments of crisis. Um, kind of like what Liz is talking about earlier, people in the middle of the crisis, they're not, they're not in that type of frame of mind to be able to have that um, more complex thinking. Um, and so uh, we, we want to list out the warning signs. So um, ch again, chain if you're able to. Uh, if you can chain out those behaviors, uh, that's going to be the best response. But if not, um, everybody's kind of at that point. So we're going to want to list out known behaviors. If it was a, um, a person that came around, a situation, dates, uh, any of those situations that, that might be a known trigger, if that's identified, uh, it's going to be helpful. Warning signs. Uh, as far as physiological symptoms. So somebody gets red in the face, they're sweating profusely, um, little kids with stomach aches, headaches, things like that, um, that they're able to identify as, um, as reasons or at least those steps that happen prior to a crisis happening. Uh, visual signs, pacing back and forth, balling up their fists, clenching their fists, their jaws, um, facial expression, like mad facial expressions before something like that happens or maybe sad. Um, those types of things and then substance use if they're you know of that age where they're they're using things that are are contributing to that crisis situation that blow out um, you know that's something that we'll want to identify as well just one thing I wanted to add to is um, another thing that I, I call them vulnerability like some things that put people out of place where they're more vulnerable for crisis situations like lack of sleep not eating 
stuff that happened during the day, anything that can kind of contribute that, I'd also include in that plan. Because a lot of times when you talk to the parents, they'll say, I didn't sleep well last night. So my reaction to him was, um, you know, 10 times worse than I would have had it normally. So what are some things that put them more vulnerable to not deal with like situations in an effective way? Um, also, like when kids are having a really bad time at school, so they're getting bullied at school and they get home and mom says, clean your room right away. That triggered him and that's what created the escalation so when you do chain make sure you're going back the night before and the, the rest of the day so that they see all the pieces uh, of that kind of contribute to this crisis because it's not just the one trigger that happened it's all the stuff that happened during the day that kind of built up on this and made them more vulnerable for a crisis situation to happen Someone else said, um, someone asked about like the police getting called. I mentioned it earlier that, um, yeah, we would call the police if there was a certain degree of escalation that happened. Um, and I think. I think there becomes a point where we're doing probably more harm than good by being there and it's not de-escalated and we might have to call law enforcement. Yeah, um, typically we don't go to the schools or um, JCC for this. Um, those are the three areas or the inpatient or the, the hospital, schools or JCC detention or residentials. We would not um, send the children mobile crisis to them. Someone asked that question too. Yeah. yeah, those are like the three areas that the, uh, the Medicaid provider manual says that we, we should not go out. Um, next slide, please. Um, list of coping strategies. So, so again, we're trying to continue along with um, keeping it brief. Um, those of you DBT trained or, you know, just typical child um, coping skills that we use, petting animals, um, tip, music, drawing. Um, I, one thing that I really, that I really like to reinforce is that it's not dumb if it works. Um, some people will be embarrassed of their coping skills, especially children. Um, you know, they'll be embarrassed by it. They think that it's silly or, you know, or whatever the reason is for thinking that. Um, but again, it's not dumb if it works. If it works, who cares? You know, there's probably a good reason why it works. Um, so listing that out and really reinforcing that, uh, especially those known strategies. Um, listing out supports, personal supports, um, you know, any extended family, friends, anything like that, um, that we could use. And we'll talk about that in a little bit for, for like respite or even just emotional calls um, that, that can provide support in those instances. Professional supports being crisis, national suicide hotline, listening ear, um, the peer warm line, things like that would be, would be helpful. Um, and, and of course, obviously the CMH caseholder if they have them. Um, and listing the numbers out. Um, sometimes in, in the heat of the moment, phones get broken, uh, you throw something, or maybe that was the cause of the crisis. Um, so, and I, if you're like me, I don't memorize phone numbers anymore. I haven't in a long time. Um, so listing out those numbers in a place would be really helpful, especially when that safety plan gets written down and gets plastered to like a refrigerator somewhere uh, or in somebody's wallet or purse. So being able to have that pretty quickly and accessible would be helpful. Um, so when we're continuing along with, with the safety plan, uh, we want to talk about making the environment safe. And that comes in two different um, sections. One, we're talking about means restriction in general. And then the other piece, we're talking about in a crisis situation. Um, so one thing we want to identify is that when we talk about means restriction portion of making the environment safe, um, we don't want the children to be around. So if we're removing sharps, we're removing firearms, or we're removing medication, things like that, we don't want the children to know where we're moving those things to um, so that they can then gain access to them. Um, we want to educate about lethal means and what it means to um, have NSIB uh, versus, uh, versus like a serious suicide attempt, um, like, uh, or like, I'm sorry, a lethal suicide attempt, like, uh, like firearms. Um, we want to educate about um, the difference between those two things where somebody who might take an overdose of medication um, is, yes, that's a potential lethal mean, but there's time in between from having taken that, that overdose to uh, being able to, to, to actually succumb to the effects of that and what we can do to intervene in between versus things like a firearm where um, if you have quick access to a firearm, make an impulsive decision, um, that, that's lethal instantly. Uh, in, in a lot of cases. So we want to be able to have that education of 
um, of lethal means and what that means. Um, to identifying preferred methods. So when we're talking about suicidal ideation, um, you know, there's a there's a misconception in the community. I'm sure that we've had this conversation before. That if you say if somebody identifies that they want to take an overdose, and you start asking about other means, like have you ever thought about killing yourself by a gun, um, that is somehow going to put this idea into their brain um, that they're just going to magically come up with this now idea to to kill themselves with this different method, and it's simply not the case. Um, so we want to try to identify the means as best as possible. Um, and then gear the safety plan and the means restriction towards those means. Um, obviously, we want to secure other things. Uh, guns are always going to be a big thing, even if that's not the identified method. We're going to want to secure guns as much as possible, just because of their lethality, their their instant reaction, the, the ability to impulsively do that um, without any takebacks. Um, so that's something we're going to want to do. But definitely identifying the means for like medications, hanging, cutting, things like that, uh, very very quickly. Um, if there's an identified location that they had previously means restricted with, um, I would definitely recommend trying to change up that location that maybe they knew about it before, or um, some people, you know, in my house, there's a closet where we put all the Christmas presents. Um, that's like our quote unquote hiding location. If, um, you know, if there's one of those hiding locations in the home, maybe picking a different spot um, to, to put those things. Lock boxes, CMIT has lock boxes that we keep on hand. Um, that uh, since we're talking about doing these go boxes, uh, we can include lock boxes in that. So that way uh, we can give them to family members free of charge so they can lock up medication, sharps, things like that. Um, and at the very least, if they have bigger items, a trunk of a vehicle might be a place to do, uh, to put things, lock away the keys. Keys are a lot higher, hard, or, I'm sorry, a lot easier to put away uh, and hide from, uh, from a kiddo than, um, than a lock box might. And all of these things are pretty much in, in the idea of uh, we want to create time and distance between the individual's thought and action towards suicide um, or, uh, you know, an impulsive behavior um, and the actual means. So the, the longer that we can create that distance and that time, the better. Um, it gives them time to, to think and it gives time for, for interactions uh, or for interventions to take place. Another part of, of steps to make the environment safe is in a crisis. So, um, you know, like say an individual gets very uh, aggressive when they're in a crisis, you might not mean to restrict, um, you know, heavy items during, uh, during a means restriction for, for safety and suicidal thoughts, but you might want to include in the safety plan how to make the environment safe in the middle of a crisis because you know that they're going to react, they might throw things, they might break things. Um, how do you remove those things from that individual or remove the individual from those things? Um, you know, like Liz was talking about earlier, if you take the child outside, if it's weather appropriate or you know, whatever, whatever reason that might be, that might be a way to make the environment safe because you're removing them from the environment. Um, so that's that's something that we can have a conversation of as well. And then one of the last pieces is, is that it's a living document. Uh, one of the critiques that we often face with, with families is that the crisis plan didn't work. Well, I would argue that the crisis plan did work, but certain parts of the crisis plan didn't work. So we we'll want to, to amend that pretty regularly, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, but identifying what did and what didn't work, if there's an existing crisis plan, what did work? What did work? Awesome. Let's reinforce that. Let's highlight that. Let's maybe bump that from the third thing on the list to the first thing on the list. What didn't work? Okay, well, this needs to be taken off because in the moment, it's a terrible idea. Um, but when we're talking about it, when things are calm, it's a great idea. So we might want to remove that from the crisis plan altogether. So just identifying and reinforcing that it's, it's a living document, something that moves and shifts. Uh, people's interests shift. People practice things and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. So we'll want to we'll want to readapt that as much as possible. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so follow up. What's going to happen at the um, at the the you know crisis is over. It's taken care of. We're done. We're moving on to the next day. So we're going to have the treatment team follow up. They're going to review the uh, the PCP after all crisis uh, children's mobile crisis contacts. Uh, which to include that they're going to update any safety issues or any safety plans in the PCP and that those PCP addendums be goal specific to the crisis if that's what's appropriate. Um, we're gonna review the safety plan. So again, it's that living document. Um, there's gonna be a safety plan created um, at that children's mobile crisis contact. Uh, we're going to want to have that uploaded to the chart in Sigmo. So that way the caseholder, the treatment team can review that with the family and say what happened. 
um, you know, did this work? We're going to want to make sure that the, the means are restricted still, that there's adherence to the plan, um, that we're going to chain the event or create a chain if that hasn't been done, if, if possible, if they're to that point. And then again, um, review it to, for its efficacy. Is it still working? What isn't working? What is working? What can we add? What can we take away? So we're going to want to review those um, after a, a children's mobile uh, crisis contact. And then we're going to review the, the contact um, with the child specifically. We're going to grab uh, feedback from the kid. How, how did it go for them? You know, like what Liz was talking about earlier, um, did a certain terminology or, or phrase or uh, something trigger things to make things worse? Did it work for them? Did it not work for them? Uh, we'll want to review that. So that way um, in the future, if the, um, the health and safety banner is updated or when it's, when it's updated, we can identify the things that worked really well and what didn't work really well. So we can just do a better job next time. <clears throat> Other options. So kind of what we had talked about earlier is what happens if the children's mobile crisis didn't work. Um, and, and we'll get into the, the question, or I'm sorry, the, the Q and A part that was asked um, asked and answered during the previous meeting, but other options that we have are family respite. We're gonna to wanna to try to push that as much as possible with families where appropriate, um, or simply separating the siblings. If uh, there's a child, there's two or multiple children having conflict with one another, maybe the answer is temporarily having that child stay with another family member or, um, or some other supported uh, respite option. Um, crisis respite through the 42nd court is a potential option as well. Um, that, that might be a little bit more feasible um, given that there's, um, you know, maybe a less acute situation happening. Um, crisis residential, there are two, well, rather there are three options, um, two of them through the Safe House program or organization. One of them is in Grand Rapids, one of them is in Warren, uh, Warren, which is down in Detroit. We do offer transportation. We'll, we'll help coordinate that um, if that's what's necessary. And then we just got contracted with a, with a Beacon Home that does children's crisis um, very similarly to the way Safe House went. Um, and they're down in Lansing. We just got that contract, I wanna say maybe like two or three weeks ago. So it's still relatively new. And I don't think that we've had a child placed there yet, um, but we did do a, a virtual tour with them because they opened up during COVID and um, it, was, uh, it looked pretty cool. Um, and then of course, inpatient hospitalization is an option as well, um, if all else fails. Uh, and then coordination. So um, before all of it, I know that we're kind of taking a step back here, but for, for the coordination piece uh, to have that discussion, um, if, if you have a case that's coming into, and you, a lot of you guys do this already, so it's just kind of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, a reinforcement of what you do, a heads up is always appreciated. Um, if you know that a family is potentially going to go into crisis, um, sending an email out to CMIT and to the children's mobile um, team, you know, CMIT can forward that on if you're, if you're not finding who the person is. Um, sending a heads up of like, hey, I just met with this family, or I know that they're getting big news or bad news or court's happening, uh, or they just haven't been doing it, whatever the situation might be, a heads up um, with what's going on, the current situation, um, and then maybe some tips and tricks that, uh, that you've worked with them to help de-escalate them in, in the past have worked really well, um, or things to remind them of. Any, any tips or pointers for that specific family is always helpful. And then um, after the, the um, children's crisis contact, then, then the health and safety banner should be updated. And once that's updated, you know, we're, we're going to have a, a conversation of um, children, or I'm sorry, of guns, dogs, or what other safety concerns in the home. So if that's updated in the chart, then CMIT can review that prior to going to the home. If we know that this family has a bunch of guns and, you know, and you know, maybe they've been opposed to previous conversations of locking the firearms up, or if they have you know, a bunch of dogs in the home or one dog or whatever the situation might be, having that updated in the health and safety banner is something that CMIT and the children's mobile workers will, will be looking at prior to going out to the home as well. All right. Are there any questions about that piece of it? I actually had a question just about overall, if we're the person who's on call going 
helping out on a call with a CMIT worker and we don't really have, we don't know the person, but we're going out to support you guys in this, you know, working with this kid and this, this family that we're going to be seeing. What can we do to help support you as CMIT workers as we're coming into the situation and working with these delicate situations that are happening in families? So you, yeah, so you and the crisis worker prior to going out to the home would have a discussion to figure out like who's going to work with the parents, who's going to work with the child, who's going to kind of take the lead. Um, and then depending on what role, like if you go in the home and you know it's mom and child that are escalating, you would either go with mom or the CMIT worker would go with mom and vice versa with the child. And so the first thing you do would be to, to separate them um, and kind of, you know, get them both calmed down. Then you guys would come back together, have a conversation of what happened, what kind of, what you think you should do during the family meeting. And then you guys would meet as a group and kind of discuss next steps and safety planning. Um, I mentioned before, sometimes you're not gonna be able to get to a full deep safety plan. Sometimes the safety plan is gonna be, we're gonna have him go to sleep tonight or he's gonna play and watch a movie and that's it. Like we're just, just you know, cause it's too triggering for them to talk more in depth about the safety plan, it's too volatile. If you can, if you can get them to a place where they're calmed down, then you do a full safety plan. But yeah, you'd be working with one of the, the family members and then coming back together at the end to do the safety plan together. Mira, are you able to share your PowerPoint? Yes, I think so. Okay. I don't know if I have to give, I'll look to see if I have to give permission. Can you see it? Yep, awesome. Okay, cool. All right, oops, I'm a little too far in. Okay, so a lot of what um, Liz talked about already is totally uh, connects and pertains. Um, but I am going to talk more specific to what are those characteristics of autism and how those characteristics um, can kind of escalate during, um, you know, triggering some of those challenging behaviors and escalate the problems during these crises. So um, kids, adults, anybody who's um, diagnosed with autism, we're really looking at the communication deficits, the social interaction issues and then also the rigid, repetitive, restricted behaviors. And I'm gonna go into a little more on that. Um, so with the communication, um, one of the big things is the echolalia. So they might be repeating what you say, and especially if they are in um, kind of an agitated situation like this. So they might, you know, you might say, what's your name or what happened? And they might just repeat that name, what's your name, things, you know, some of that. And it doesn't mean that they are actually understanding. They might also have trouble asking for help or not even understanding that they need to ask for help. Um, a big part of the communication deficit is not understanding nonverbal language. So they might not be able to recognize your facial cues or um, some of the gestures. Um, a lot of times they might express fear in um, inappropriate ways or unexpected ways. I mean, sometimes we'll even see them start laughing kind of hysterically when they're scared or anxious. Um, it will take them longer to process information. So when we ask a question, whether they're doing the repeating or not saying anything, it helps if you can give them, you know, take a longer pause than you normally would to give them time to um, process it. If we keep asking, you keep coming back with a question, then that can, um, you know, kind of cause more problems there too. Um, so they might just also have trouble understanding directions or being able to follow directions, um, taking things literally too. So, you know, if you say hang tight, that might mean something, you know, like what am I supposed to hang on to? Um, so trying to keep language simple and direct, just like Liz was saying. And then as far as like the social pieces, some of that is, um, you know, not understanding people's words or reactions, um, not really understanding rules, like unwritten rules. We all understand, you know, we know things that society expects of us and they might not understand that, or um, there's also less of a motivation to, um, to kind of make people happy, to 
uh, have that social interaction. They're less likely to gain somebody's approval. Um, they don't understand the emotions of, of others, and especially if it's not someone they're close to. And with the social impairments, um, they, might, they might get upset by physical contact. They might also get too close to you. So with, spec with autism being a spectrum, you're gonna see that wide range, whether it's the communication, the social, any of it. So you might have where um, they are right up in your face and it doesn't mean they're being aggressive to you, but you also might have where if you, you know, even try to give them a gentle touch, that could be a trigger. And then um, the third kind of piece that we're looking at with the diagnosis is those restrictive repetitive behaviors. Um, and so this is, you know, like the typical things that we might think of with flapping or pacing, um, some of those things that you can see, but there's also a lot of internal stuff that where they, they do much better with routine and um, following the same pattern. So obviously in a crisis, it's not gonna be routine. There's gonna be changes in their, um, what they normally do. So though that can be really hard for them. Um, transitions can be really difficult. Um, routines they need, um, their fixated interests are a good thing to keep in mind though too. So if you notice, or if it's in the safety plan or parents mention, um, oh, he's really in, you know, he likes Pokemon or even hears somebody say something about, oh, Roblox or whatever that interest might be. If you can pick up on that, you might be able to use that as you're going forward. And um, when you're having, you know, out there walking with them and communicating, you might be able to um, comment on some of those preferred interests. Um, they might repeat certain words, um, certain body movements. Uh, something we see a lot is kind of back to the echolalia, but it can be um, delayed echolalia where they maybe have certain shows they watch or um, you know videos and they will have certain phrases that they will say over and over. And especially if they're only using it at certain parts, it might not even be apparent that that's, they're just pulling it out of having watched cars or whatever their movie is. But this can, um, you might see some of that going on too. Uh, the rigid thinking, and again, the more um, the more things are out of out of uh, their routine, you might it might get more and more rigid because they're trying to have some kind of control. And then the repetitive movements. So that is again, you know, we call it stimming from self stimulation. And you might hear families refer to always oh, stimming. Um, that is, can be flapping. Um, you know, some kids have like strings or other fidget toys that they will be playing with, you know, even pulling their hair. And so a lot of things that, that might look like they're, um, you know, just doing those, uh, those self-stimulation and that generally helps them calm. So if you can see, it can either be where it is help, um, a sign that they're escalating, but it can also be that they're using it to help calm themselves. And if you can see where it's bringing them down, then reinforce that. So um, this is just real quick on um, how having ASD can have an even Im bigger impact in an emergency too. Um, you know, so that fight or flight, like you mentioned, and not responding to stop or other commands. So again, if they're out eloping, you know, that can be really even more difficult. They might not respond to their name um, and then engaging in those repetitive behaviors. I'm going to... Okay, so then the common, these are common challenging behaviors. These are not um, part of the diagnosis of autism, but these are things that we often see with kids with autism because of those, those pieces that I talked about, those characteristics. Um, it might lead to some of these. So like the property destruction, uh, verbal aggression, elopement, non-compliance, um, and that can be whether they're actually coming out and refusing to do something or even just unable to follow directions and back to the communication deficit with that. Um, you can see physical aggression of, you know, actually attacking somebody else or like you'd mentioned animals um, can be the front of it too. And then the self-injury. So um, there can be anywhere again with the self-injury where it is more of the stimming kind of thing where it's, you know, pulling hair, biting hands, some of that, where maybe it's not, um, extremely uh, dangerous at that point, all the way to like banging their head on cement uh, floor. So 
obviously we need to look at what we can do to prevent some of that. Um, and I wanted to throw in about elopement too, because again, if you get a call on it, and obviously then law enforcement can be called if they're already out. But if you're out with, you know, you're at the home and like Liz was saying, you know, they might take off running. Just keep in mind that they often are drawn to water. They might be drawn to things that they are preferred, you know, some of their preferred special interests. So train tracks, um, a fire station, um, tractors, you know, any of that stuff. We've also seen kids go into people's homes, neighbors' homes, maybe because they're trying to get to it, the food, you know, they're rummaging in the refrigerator. Um, we have found where kids end up in a neighbor's uh, car inside their garage eating their candy. So, I mean, they could be all kinds of places like that, but just kind of keep it in mind with that. And if it's chaos and things are, you know, out of their routine, they could even be like hiding under a bed. So um, just keeping that in mind too. And the more that the parents are aware of oh yeah, he loves the trains or, you know, those particular interests, that's going to help you um, kind of direct them to. Um, so behavior, kind of the definition here, a simple definition is just that behavior is an action in response to any stimulation. So it's a form of communication. It occurs because it's serving a function and produces an outcome. Um, and the more consistently that that behavior produces the same outcome, the stronger that behavior is going to occur, is going to happen in the future. And you all know that, but just that little reminder there. Um, so there's basic functions of behavior. We really talk about four functions, but I narrow it down even more to two, access and escape. So if you can kind of have an idea, again, I know a lot of times in crisis, parents will say, I have no idea why they're doing this. But you know, whether it's the problem solving or even later when you're doing the safety plan and you're going back and looking at those pieces like you talked about, you might then start clicking and be able to help the parents understand that, oh, they were X, they wanted access to something or they were trying to escape something. So access, a direct access is you're doing it yourself. So, you know, pour yourself a cup of coffee. But if it's socially mediated, so through another person, you might be asking someone to pour you a cup of coffee, or it could be a lot more you know, um, less effective ways of trying to get somebody to get you something. And then the same with escape. You might be, you know, you directly, you go turn down the radio because the noise is bothering you, or you can ask somebody to turn it down, or you can scream and hopefully they will turn it down. So there's, you know, both the escape and the access. Um, and then with that too, going a little deeper is you can be access or escape of social attention. So, we might be trying to gain, you know, praise, reprimands, playing with somebody, gaining information. That's all accessing um, somebody's attention, really. Um, or you're trying to escape. And again, it could be you're escaping somebody's praise. There are definitely people that don't like to be praised, um, but also reprimands. You're asking me too many questions. I'm going to try to escape that. And then accessing sensory or escaping it. So again, a lot of our kids with autism have extra sensory needs. And they can be, you know, the same kid and have some needs where they need that extra sensory input. So we talked about weighted blankets. That can be that pressure that feels good or, you know, somebody touching them. But it could be they like the weighted blanket, but if you touch them, that that's too much. So there can be um, that escape of that sensory of you touching them. Um, you know, could be clothes that don't feel good or they're cold or they're hot, you know, some of those other pieces, a certain sound, a smell. And so that's also where we might say, you know, okay, let's turn down the lights. Let's, you know, okay, take away that screaming uh, toddler, you know, into a different room. So some of those pieces too. Um, and then this is just an example of how the same behavior, so the behavior of elopement, running away, could be um, a function of different air, of different things. So he might be trying to access areas of high interest, like the train tracks, the pool, the you know, whatever it is. Um, he might be trying to escape the noisy, crowded environment, a task, an unexpected change. Or it might just be that sensory feeling of just he likes running, he likes that feeling of the air, and he might return safely. So again, it's um, kind of digging down to figure out what it is, and then Part of in that future 
of knowing, you know, not in the crisis, but in the future of knowing what it is that we might be able to help in the safety planning of, okay, let's provide an alternate way of getting that. So that's a little bit of the proactive strategies here. So the proactive are partly for, you know, things that we're always telling the parents. And I'm sure like when CMIT gets called, you're probably asking, do you have a safety plan? I assume that's one of the first things that's being checked. If they have a safety plan, are we reminding you, you know, what are those preferred interests? What are those, you know, some of the things that you talked about? What are the triggers? What can you do? What can you don't? What are some of the people you can call? Some of that. Um, well, we also encourage parents to, you know, have, like the ID card, have uh, practice safety scenarios with them too. So, you know, if if we're going to have a police officer stop us, these are some of the things that might happen. Um, one thing I want to mention too, I, I probably have it further on, but I've got here about working with local fire department on safest ways to secure home preventing employment, elopement. Um, one thing we do often see with families that have kids with a lot of elopement issues is you might go into the home and see where they have locks, locking you know, on the outside of the bedroom door, so it locks them in. Um, you might see alarms all over the place. You might see bars on the windows. Um, they, you know, sometimes they're adding all of those protective pieces to try to keep their kids safe. Again, a, as we're working with them not in a crisis, we're encouraging them to be working with um, you know, their local departments to figure out what is the safe way to do this. You know, there's a lot of agencies like Autism Alliance um, that can provide, you know, GPS detectors and maybe alarms and, you know, other things to help them too. But just kind of letting you know that that could be something you might see. Um, so when you're first on the scene, obviously you're with your, your partner here from CMIT, but letting them know why you're there um, because they might be afraid of you because you're an unknown person. Um, really, again, hopefully the state family has a safety plan, but it's unlikely they do. Um, and then just noticing that, yeah, you might see some of these um, things that might warrant a 3,200 call, but it's, it could be because of the autism. Um, respect. So assuming the individual understands your words, even if they don't respond. So again, kind of back to that communication deficit. Um, they, they might not be responding at all. They might be doing the repeating. Um, you know, they, there might be the pause, but still talk to them as if they're understanding, because as the more we are with these kids, we do discover they really do understand what we are saying. And the more that you're talking about them to somebody else, um, it really limits your rapport at that point. Um, and then validate their fears and their worries. You know, again, this is some of what Liz has already said too. You know, keeping the language simple, but also things like, you know, I can see you're angry because your plans have changed. Um, some of that. And then building up any strengths or successes that you do see, you know, if you can say, I like how you sat down, you know, um, you're breathing good. You know, I like how you, you're not screaming. So any of that, that can be positives. I mean, they might very well be in a situation where they've only been having lots of negative comments thrown at them for a while. Um, providing a safe place. So again, going outside, taking a walk with you. Um, if you can go, you know, to a corner somewhere calm. And if that can be removing that, you know, the extra light the sounds and noises, offering them some of the fidget toys. And one of that too is if you're offering them, you know, a, um, a squeeze ball, show them how to do it. You know, you might actually just kind of pick it up and kind of play with it. And that might entice them, you know, while you're talking to them, they might then want it as opposed to just handing it to them and assuming they're A, going to know what to do with it and B, they might just throw it at you or someone else. So, you know, kind of making it more of, Here's something that is calming and always modeling that calming behavior. Um, calm and quiet. So be calm and patient using those simple but concrete sentences instead of like, you know, hang tight, it's sit here. Um, don't overload with information or questions. Don't raise your voice or immediately repeat yourself. And like I said before, giving them time to be able to respond, time to process and respond. Um, clear and consistent, inform them of transitions too. If you're going to be taking them into another room or 
okay, we're going to be going outside, you know, anything that's going to be changing, even we're going to put the dogs in the other room, you know, any of that can help so that they know what is going to be coming. Um, if you've got a schedule or timer, visuals, I love what um, Liz had with the different pictures, because we can use that too. So they might not, you know, they're having trouble with that processing, but they might be able to respond to you by pointing to a picture of something that's helping. Um, be prepared. Okay, so if you do see some of these signs of increased frustration, more pacing, clapping hands, you know, their vocal sounds are increasing, just, you know, be prepared and think about what you can do. Um, avoid making quick, unexpected movements or loud noises or touching them. If you're going to touch them, if you need to touch them, let them know beforehand, you know, I'm going to touch your arm now. Um, some of that just to prepare them. Using the first then language too, you know, first you need to sit, then I'm gonna give you your iPad. So some of those pieces that, again, we talk about first then um, kind of the grandma's rule. So if you think about grandma has you eat your peas before you can have your cookie. Um, so, you know, kind of there's something that they need to do that maybe they don't really wanna do, but getting them to do that, but then they get something really great. Um, and then, this one is like responding to the challenges when it's, you know, they, it's gotten to that point where it's really escalated. It might be what you're coming into. Um, so the redirection, again, encouraging them to focus on something else. So if you can even just, you know, you're showing them a toy, you start talking about something else, uh, offering them the coloring pages, anything to kind of break it away from the focus of what is causing the big problem. Um, if you can ignore the behavior, so let's say it's a lot of screaming. If you can ignore it, it's not hurting anyone, then ignore it. Don't talk about it while you're trying to redirect. Um, offering alternate tasks. Again, the doing something preferred before what they have to do. Um, so that's the opposite then of the grandma's cookie rule. Um, and then giving choices. So... Liz mentioned three choices. I think that's a great point of having um, three, you know, but even just two, if you, you've got to give them choices that either one you're okay with, the family is okay with, but keeping it simple, you know, do you want to sit in this room or do you want to go outside? So that there's, they are then having a little bit of sense of control. Um, we will encourage breathing. Um, I've heard Liz say this many times of like having a blow bubbles. Um, you know, even just deep breaths. And I find too, that if I am kind of modeling that and practicing it without saying it in words, just doing some of that, they can, you'll see it kind of is imitated then. Um, so that can help. And then keep in mind too, if you try to restrain, which hopefully there's not a reason to restrain, but they're more likely to flight to you know, flee or fight you if you are trying to restrain. Um, and then my last slide is just safe. Just keep in mind these things of S for simple language, that you know, clear, clear directions, keeping it simple um, and kind of limiting it. A, allowing space. So that's that physical space that both Liz and I talked about, um, you know, maybe space away from the other people, but also I think of the space to give them time to, um, to comprehend and to respond. Uh, flexible, F for flexible. So sometimes you need to lower the demands, you know, like she said, sometimes you're going to give them the iPad doing things that would be normally would be like, you know, that's going to reinforce that behavior. But now you might, you know, instead of, you know, mom's been saying they have to clean the whole room. Well, if you pick up this uh, toy, then you can have your iPad, you know, so lowering that. Um, and then also F flexible, you know, with the fidgets or any kind of redirection that you can do. And then E, the encourage self-regulation, I think that's a big one. And it kind of goes back to what both Liz and Christian were saying about like that kind of afterwards, the what, you know, looking back and all right, they're calmed down now, don't just leave it. You know, it's okay, we're at that moment, we're gonna be telling them, you did a great job calming down. I like how you were breathing. You know, again, don't overuse the words, but just letting them know and some of that concrete example so that they can see it but hopefully that can help them um, know for future uses. So if we're looking at then working on a safety plan, you know, and we might be able to say, you know, they're trying to think, oh, I'm not sure about the coping, 
know, you might say, hey, remember when you counted to 10 with me? Did that help? You know, so maybe some of those things too that you might be able to um, kind of prompt them. You know, like Christian said, sometimes they think they're silly, you know, and maybe they're not even thinking about that this actually helped me calm down too. But you've noticed it that, wow, that made a difference. So if you can mention it, that might help. So I think that's, yep, that's all I have. So I'll stop sharing. So any specific questions for me? It looks like someone just said, um, just adding off of what you were saying that like sometimes parents will say nothing triggered me, but when you kind of go back after the fact and do a chain analysis or kind of, um, you know, talk to them about chains then they notice that there was a lot of triggers and warning signs prior to what happened. And you'll notice that when you first start working with any family, they're going to say, all of a sudden this person just blew up and like threw the TV out of the window. Um, but when you continue to establish a relationship with them, you'll start figuring out that there's a lot of chains that the parents could have attempted a different option for them. Um, but in the moment, it's hard for them to think about those things because they do see it as like he went from zero to a hundred. Um, that's why I always talk about vulnerability factors too. You know, if you have a child that was bullied all day in school and they come home and mom, the first thing mom says to him or her is go clean your room and doesn't validate him or doesn't talk to him or do anything that's going to trigger him. And he's going to get more angry than if he didn't have a bad day at school, you know? So there's a lot of vulnerability that happens, um, especially with kids with autism too. I mean, if they, they don't have sleep, if they're not eating correctly, if they're not like they had a lot of stimulation during the day or something changed in their schedule, that one change in their schedule can create this escalation for them. Um, you know, all kids need schedules. And for a lot of our families, they don't schedule stuff. They don't talk to them about transitions. They don't give the child an opportunity to know when the next transition will occur. And so modeling any of that stuff is helpful. Um, I'm glad you brought up too, Mary, the fact about not touching people. Um, you always ask permission um, prior to touching anyone, even in like a, a nice way, like touching someone's shoulder, because in the past people weren't given, like people might've been traumatized by stuff that happened in their life because people did stuff to them without permission. So we always ask permission if we're going to touch them. Um, if you have to kind of move in front of them in front of traffic or something like that, you're always going to kind of talk to them and tell them that's what you're doing. You know, you're, you're going to let them know what's happening um in that process but yeah that's a good point stephanie because the first time they will say it was zero to 100 and then the next day when you talk to them they'll be able to keep building the chain and then the next interaction like the next time you have therapy with them you can do another chain analysis and they'll keep being able to add chains to it and really look at yeah my kid clenched his you know hand or yeah my kid started pacing and so i knew that something was going to happen and they'll, they're able to identify it um Parents and themselves can't identify body stuff too either. They don't understand their own sensations because of their, their trauma and other stuff that's happened in their life. So sometimes it's teaching the parent to teach the child, but really you're teaching the parent these new skills. You know? You're teaching them about body sensations as you're informing them to teach their children or do the safety plan. You're doing it through the parent, but the parent's learning as much as the kid in it. Um, that's why I love adolescent DBT because you're teaching both of them at the same time. Um, but thanks, Mary. That, that was really helpful. Um, if you if there's a situation where you do call the police and the child does have autism, always tell the police officer that the child has autism. Um, I learned something really profound in the last um, training I did with police that police and their interactions with kids with autism think that they are not, they're lying or they're deceptive because they take longer to respond, and so the they think that the child's trying to lie about it or, or not tell the truth, but it's really, they're processing things before responding. And so giving the police, a lot of police have gotten a lot more training in autism. If, you, if they know that they're gonna respond different to the child, um, they're gonna give them that space to kind of react. Um, so you always give as much information as you can to them so that they know what they're responding to. Um, and it's always helpful if you have a consumer to, if you can put it in 911 dispatch, like some information about them so that please do know when they respond because um, they'll respond a lot different. Um, Sarah had a question in the, the chat about um, paperwork and Christian's gonna go over the question and answer, which will go in the paperwork stuff. But anyone have any last questions for Mary on working with children with autism? Well, thank you, Mary, I appreciate it. 
No, Are you able to pull that up, Chris? Yep, I got to pull okay. it up. Um, one of my lessons from last time. <laughs> All right, uh, there it is. Okay, so this is a list that was compiled from the last training of just some, some questions that we wanted to be able to, to answer for everybody. Can everybody see that okay? Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and read through them and answer them. Um, so one of the questions was, what if there's a safety issue that occurs in the home? Um, if a staff person goes out to the home and they uh, and there's a safety concerns that happen, staff can always make the decision to turn away um, from providing or to providing virtual or phone options to the family, or we can just decline the service. I mean, if that's if that's how it ends up going, um, it, you know, it, it's always something that can be changed at any point. You know, it's not a uh, once we've said yes, this is what we're going to do. We're locked into that. So if the situation changes and we need to to reassess for assess for our own safety. Um, for the family safety, that's definitely something that, that we can do and, and is supported. Um, so that, that's the answer for that. Um, will an on-call children's uh, crisis worker have to go alone to meet uh, if they meet in a safe location? Uh, the children's on-call worker would not go to a safe location or out to the home unless CMIT staff is available to go out to the member. If they feel to call um, or the virtual contact, CMIT is not available, but we would not initiate the response. So no, you would not go out alone um, uh, by, by yourself to a situation, um, even if it's deemed to be safe. CMIT is the one that goes out and we have those after hour locations that we that we uh, utilize. Um, are there any children or family able, uh, eligible or open? Okay, so anyways, it, it's available to any um, child uh, or family in, in our catchment area. Uh, we have a time limiter, time limits that we're supposed to respond in. Um, for urban environments, it's an hour. For uh, rural environments, it's two hours. I think all of ours count, count as two hours. Um, so we'd be able to try, unless something's different with that, Liz. It's all, it's all two hours, right? I'm gonna go with yes, because she didn't say no. Um, so, um, I mean, when I think of urban, I think more like Lansing, Ann Arbor, this type thing. Um, Let's see, how are contacts documented, which I'm sure kind of goes back to Sarah's question here. So th this has actually changed that we just found out about today. So this is fresh off the press. Um, so previously before COVID, uh, back in 2017, there were different codes. So those of you that remember the, the BC times, this is gonna look different to you. For everybody else, this is all just how it's always been. Um, so at, when we are documenting uh, these crisis contacts, we're only using um, progress notes, okay? And the code that you'd be using is the H2011 um, with the HT modifier, okay? That's how, how CMIT and the, the on-call clinician is going to document. Here, here's where it's different. CMIT is going to document the billable service. So CMIT is gonna do a progress note using the H211 HT code, and they're going to do client present face-to-face, -face, okay? And they're going to document from their perspective as well as you know the safety planning procedure piece of it and, and how all that goes. Um, the on-call person is going to also complete a progress note using the same H2011 HT code. However, they're going to document that as consultation support staff only. So it's not a billable service, but that way you're documenting the, the efforts that you had and your perspective of that contact. Okay. So you know, previously it was different. This is the way that it's going to be running now. That's per MDHHS guidelines. Okay, um, for for the the CPT code piece of it. If the situation turns into an emergency screen, if it turns into an emergency screen, will we determine that we need to be assessing for that, uh, or or have that individual be hospitalized, crisis residential, whatever that ends up being? Then CMIT will complete that at the hospital after medical clearance takes place. Okay, so that's not something that you need to be worried about in the moment. Um, any questions about that before I move on? Can I ask a question? Yep. What happens if one staff like that you go out with is more apt to want to like, like stay in the situation versus the other one wants to leave? Like, are we supposed to stick together? Because sometimes yeah, so people's if you go together, you need to be leaving together. So and you wouldn't be going by yourself. So I, I, never, I never want to be in a situation where you're alone at a, at a consumer's house. I guess you mine would be more or less if you're both already there and like something like 
things are going on and one feels like they want to leave, but the other one feels like it's not a big deal. Like, does that make sense to you? There's like a clinical dis like a disagreement, then you can always call consult with me or Christian. We rotate on call. So okay. I bring one of us in. Um, people are gonna have different tolerance for for safety things. We don't want to call the police unless we absolutely have to. And there's gonna be situations where you're gonna call the police, but there's gonna be different tolerance levels. Um, you know, some people that have been in home base for a really long time, you are doing crisis mobilization for the first month of any family opening. Uh, that's what you do. Every time you go out to a home and you're opening a case in home base, you're doing crisis. Um, so some people are going to have higher tolerances than others. If there's there's a, a significant disagreement between the two of them, just con consult with me or Christian on it. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood your question. No, that's okay. Yeah, no, I mean, and part of that's going to be taken care of when you come together and meet as, as that as, at the end of that contact, at that contact, I can't talk today, it's rough. Um, at the end of the contact, when you meet together as a family team and a treatment team, you're, you're going to be having those conversations and, and should feel pretty kosher about the situation. Um, but again, if you need to consult, consult, um, CMIT is going to have um, my phone number and Liz's phone number and know who the correct person is to, to consult with. Um, any other questions? I just go through all of them and then we can ask questions at the end. Okay. Um, if a consumer goes to the ED, does CMIT take over um, at, or does the on-call person complete the emergency screen? Yes, CMIT is supposed to be taking over. Um, is there a cutoff time um, for agreeing to go out? And at what point do we stop receiving calls? So the program goes from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, uh, Monday through Friday, and then and we'll talk about the holiday piece. Um, but uh, if we get close to 10 p.m. and it looks like hospitalization might be needed, then a family should be routed to the emergency room and the CMIT will take care of it. So, I mean, we're going to take each one of those situations into consideration when we're filtering people for um, for the appropriateness of this the situation. Um, and then transportation resources that are available, natural supports, volunteer drivers. We have um, Scott and Misty out of um, out of Macosta and Osceola counties, um, CSTs if they're available um, and per, per approval, gas cards um, are an option. We have those um, on hand in the offices. Um, and then cabs if there's a PO that can be completed, um, which is not always the case, but sometimes it's an option. Um, how are children's workers being compensated? So just by taking the on-call, you're, you're getting $20 per day. Um, if you get called out to respond to the scene, it's $118. Um, it says per screen, uh, but what it means is like, you know, per, per one of those contacts. Um, if a screen takes over three hours, then the crisis worker will earn comp leave, um, you know, beyond, beyond that um, three hour window. Um, mileage for the on-call is from the home to the location and back at the uh, sorry at the uh, agency convenience. Um, holidays and on-calls, both people will receive the $118 per uh, stipend per, per contact. So you'll get your stipend, um, and then the CMIT person will that's responding, um, and that's just that's more of a CMIT thing. What you need to be worried about is is that you'd be getting paid per contact. Um, and then there's more information that the, uh, that's going to be in the policy. Our resource books are going to be uh, uh, going to be completed for each staff member. So each county should develop their own resource uh, books because it's going to be depending on which county that they're, they're residing in, uh, including paperwork from the internet. So like the resources tab that's on there. Um, and then each county should have a packet um, for, of uh, the action notices or like the, the action letters and, and all that good stuff. And the CMIT will also be there on hand to help um, to, to help facilitate some of that conversation as well. Um, and then there's some other additional information. So how to call 911 discreetly. So on a, on a Samsung phone, you'd hold down the, the power button. Um, and for iPhones, which CMIT will, will have, that's the CMIT's work phone. We'll be able to press down the lock button five times. That's the end of those questions. Any questions off the cuff? I have a couple. Um, my first, when you said if they go to the ER, CMIT takes over, do you mean that only the CMIT worker needs to be there and do the screen or? Yes, okay, you're nodding heads, okay, so I'll make sure. Yeah, so we we would never go out like the, the two team members would never go out to a school to detention or to the inpatient unit. So the police had to be called out 
or you guys pivot away from that, then CMIT will, will handle like the emergency screen. If you guys go out, like there's been situations where I've gone out to a home and it looked like they were having a party. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute. And I, I was like, I'm pivoting away. Like, and I called them on the phone. I'm like, it doesn't seem like a good time right now for us to come out. We can offer you virtual, then CMIT can take that over and, and see if they need to go to the ED or do a screen over the phone. Oh, you can't stay for the party. <laughs> the other question I have is that home-based and case managers, sometimes they get crisis calls on their own caseload that they handle during the day. Are they then now to take CMIT with them? And like, does this go both ways or is this only if CMIT gets a call? No, so like if they're like on their own caseload, if the home-based worker is, is going to do like a regular session with them, the home-based worker can go out. This is only for like unknown. So if the home-based worker is not available that day, they're on annual leave, sick leave, whatever, and an on-call worker is going out with CIT has to go out. So the mobile crisis team are for unknown people or people unknown to the caseholders. People need to go out per the, the uh, requirements. There are state requirements that dictate the two team. But if it's your own case, like if I'm a home base worker and I get a call and I'm available to go, they can go out on their own and deal with it like a, a normal situation where they would change around their schedule. Okay. So if it's a caseholder that's responding and it's a home they're familiar with, they can go on their own. If it was a consumer that's not open to us or it's someone responding who's not uh, familiar with that consumer in that home, then two people would. Yep. Okay. And the reason why the state did two people is because this is open to anyone in the community and they just want to make sure for safety reasons that it's a two person team. That's why CMIT would take charge if they went to the ED. You know, we don't need two people at those those safe locations like the school, JCC, the emergency room, after hours, CMIT locations. Yeah. And the I mean, the purpose is to divert. We're trying to divert. And if they're already in the ED, it's kind of tough to do some of that stuff. We're trying to prevent them from going to the ED as much as possible. But yeah. Um, the two progress notes is also, you're going to have a different perspective than someone else. And so that's why we're having both staff to do the progress note, because one will be with one family member and another with another family member. We want both sides of this story. Um, but CMIT will do the one that's actually off, you know, going to have a, a actual um, authorization connected to it. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, just want to make sure. So, I mean, my history is in ACT. So I'm curious about a little bit of the call filtering. Does it go straight to... Um, Goes to CMIT and CMIT would do the questionnaire. And based mm -hmm. on the questionnaire, if um, they can answer no to the COVID questions and no to the safety questions during the daytime hours, they'll try to connect with the caseholder. If the caseholder is not available, then they would connect with whoever's on call for that county and the two of them would get dispatched to the home. So CMIT would be reaching out to per se me and then yeah. I would be connecting with them and then we'd be going from there. Okay. Yeah. And then you guys would plan like, like what Kristen mentioned, sometimes you guys can plan to meet in a parking lot and go together out to the home, whatever is going to work, but you want to have some kind of communication prior to getting to the home so that you guys can like um, figure out who's going to take the lead and who's going to kind of go with which family member. Most of the time you'll know kind of what's going on because the mom or dad or somebody and already called and said, this is kind of what's going on. So you'll know before you go out to the home, this is kind of what happened. I mean, stuff could happen in the meantime, but um, you'll know kind of what's going to happen. So you'll be able to problem solve that prior to going out because you're going to want to have some kind of plan, like a preliminary plan of how you're going to handle it. You don't want to go in there and be like, who's taking what? And, you know, you, you want to go in there being like, I'm going to do this and that. But that will be directed by CMIT. So Liz, I missed, I, I must have not heard or misunderstood. So home-based Obviously, they're still doing. They're already doing their crises during the day. But are you are you saying if they get a crisis at night, they're doing that by themselves without CMIT? If home base gets a call on their own case and they feel comfortable going out to the the home of their own people, they can go out without initiating the crisis mobile intervention team. So, do um, they get compensated base, for that, or is that comp time? That's part of their job. Okay, that's yeah. what I wanted to double check. 
Okay. That's part of their, that's part of their role. Like when I, when, you know, I supervise MST, my expectations for the MST therapist is that they rearrange and go out if a uh, family needs them. And so they, they're going to rearrange, but if the home-based worker is gone, not available, um, you know, something else is going on, they're dealing with another crisis, whatever, and the on-call worker is called in, then that on-call worker is the one that's going to get the stipend and then get the, the uh, rate for the screen. After hours too, I mean, home base only works certain after hours. I mean, typically, at least, it, you know, most of the counties, you guys, like most of them will be like, I'll work Tuesdays and Thursdays late, depending on what families I work with. If it's not their late night, we have no expectation that home based workers are going to be handling their cases till 10 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Um, that, I mean, that's going to be the on call, you know, they need to have balance and yeah. Thank so you. it's more during the daytime hours that, you know, during the normal daytime hours if home base gets a call, they can, they can go out to their home and um, their own homes. I know some people have to go. That's okay. I'm going to stop the recording. Um,